morning, everyone. <clears throat> My call with uh, fellow governors in the White House uh, this after is going to be this afternoon at 2 o'clock instead of the usual 11 o'clock. So unfortunately, I don't have any new information to share with you just yet. Uh, but we'll let you know if there are any developments uh, after that meeting this afternoon. Yesterday, we began phase 5A of our vaccine rollout, those 55 and older with certain high-risk conditions. On the first day, under 10,000 have signed up, which is a bit fewer than we had hoped. As you may remember, uh, we had planned to roll out 5B, uh, those 16 and over, on Monday. Um, so we're going to move that up. We're going to move that date up until uh, up to Thursday instead. Uh, as a reminder, the total population of this group is about 75,000. So um, we want to make sure that we get to them as quickly as possible. Uh, Secretary Smith will talk about this in more detail in his remarks. At the same time, we also started on a parallel track to vaccinate school staff, child care providers, more troopers, and correctional staff. Again, this second track is possible as a result of increased federal supply, which includes the single-dose Johnson & Johnson vaccine. As we've done from the beginning, our focus has been about protecting the health and safety of Vermonters, and in this case, it's our kids. As the data has shown, they're struggling with mental health as a result of the pandemic and the remote and hybrid learning that came with it. That's why putting school staff and childcare workers on this parallel track is critical and in line with our work to prioritize health and safety. Once we complete this phase, everyone in the state who is at most risk of severe illness and death will have had the opportunity to be protected. The good news is, so far, we've seen a high uptake rate uh, with over 80% of those in the 75 plus age band having received at least one dose. Getting the vaccine is important, not only to protect yourself, but the entire state. So the high acceptance rate is something we need to continue to strive for. So let's keep it up by signing up when it's your turn. Secretary Smith will have more on vaccines in a few minutes. Next, as you may have seen, yesterday the CDC made some changes to its guidance on gatherings for people who are vaccinated. I just want to remind folks that last week we made similar changes, allowing those vaccinated to gather with others who are vaccinated as well, and with one household that is not. On Friday, we'll be taking another step forward, this time for those who haven't yet been vaccinated, but we'll talk about that in more detail on Friday. Over the last 12 months, we've taken one of the most methodical and disciplined approaches to the virus in the nation, which has made us one of the safest states. After Halloween, we saw cases rise significantly because of large parties and get-togethers at homes. So before Thanksgiving, we restricted multi-household gatherings to help slow the virus down. And most importantly, to save lives while we were waiting for a vaccine. Since the January peak, and with vaccinations ramping up for the most vulnerable, we've seen a significant decline in deaths as well as hospitalizations. Our positivity rate has also come down from over 3% to around 1.7%, which is one of the lowest in the country. So on Friday, we plan to announce changes for small gatherings as well. This will have an impact on other areas like restaurants too, so stay tuned. I know everyone is anxious to get back to normal, but even as we vaccinate more people, it's as important as ever to follow the public health guidelines like wearing a mask, washing your hands, staying physically distanced, and staying home when sick. We're in the final quarter of this very tough game, so let's I'll do our part so we can exit the pandemic as quickly as possible. And with that, I'll turn it over to Commissioner Pichek for our weekly modeling update. Commissioner Pichek. Uh, thank you very much, Governor, and, and good morning, everyone. You know, this week in Vermont, we reported 
901 new COVID-19 cases, over 200 more cases when compared to last week, and the most weekly cases we've reported in a month. You can see that the increase uh, is represented in the increase in the seven-day average. A week ago, we were averaging under 100 cases. Today, we're averaging just over 130 cases per day. Certainly, the COVID-19 outbreak at the Newport prison contributed to the rise in cases this week. However, even when you remove these cases from our case count, you can see that cases are still increasing in Vermont over the past few days, albeit more gradually. If we were looking solely at this case data, you might be discouraged. However, a closer look at our data reveals that we are making continued progress and there are greater reasons for hope today than at any other time during the pandemic. First, looking at our most vulnerable age group, we see that even though overall cases have slowly improved and recently ticked up, the cases among our most vaccinated, those who are 70 years and older, have fallen more rapidly and continue to fall as well. Similarly, the number of long-term care facility cases re has remained remarkably low, with only five cases in the last three weeks and only two active outbreaks. These critical improvements among our most vulnerable are not due to chance, but as the governor mentioned, because of the significant uptake in vaccinations that we're seeing among these populations. Over 82% of Vermonters 75 and older have either started or completed their vaccination. This compares to a U.S. average that's closer to 70% for this age group. We're also making significant progress among those 65 to 74 years old, with thousands more scheduled to receive their vaccines in the coming weeks. With fewer, fewer vulnerable individuals contracting the virus, we're also seeing reductions in hospitalizations. In particular, a steady decrease this week in the number of people in the ICU. And as of today, no one requiring ventilation. When you look collectively at these metrics and compare them to the peak we experienced back in January, you can see how much we've improved among these most vulnerable populations. And with these metrics improving, most importantly, we can anticipate the COVID fatality rates in Vermont will drop for the rest of this month and into the future, with March forecasting seven to 10 deaths, a significant decrease from what we saw in December and a step down from what we saw in January and February. Looking collectively at this data, it is probably the most optimistic I have been since the start of the pandemic because we're seeing the impact of vaccinations. But to get to that finish line, we really need everyone to receive a vaccine and for all of us to continue to follow that basic public health guidance until we've made more significant vaccination progress. Even with the uptick in cases this week, Vermont is forecasted uh, to have a steady uh, uh, trajectory of cases that will not rise any further and is still projected to see a gradual decrease and then a more steady decrease as we get into spring. Similarly, our hospital forecast expects resources to be much more uh, than sufficient to cover all the need over the next six weeks. And looking at Vermont's vaccination progress, for the first time, we are averaging over 4,000 daily doses administered on a seven-day average, which is a 14% increase week over week. In terms of where we rank nationally, in terms of doses administered, Vermont currently ranks 13th nationally and third in the Northeast. And in terms of fully vaccinated Vermonters, we place 11th nationally. But another encouraging sign regarding vaccinations comes from a Pulse survey conducted by the U.S. Census Bureau that found among those who are not yet vaccinated, almost 70% of Vermonters said they would definitely get the vaccine, which is the highest ranking in the country. But as you can also see, there's still a significant number of people who are unsure about the vaccine. And as you saw from today's data, getting vaccinated is the key to getting out of the pandemic. And it's certainly important to encourage your friends and your family to step up when it's their turn. Giving a brief overview of the regional and national data, you'll see that after a stall last week, 
The cases in the northeast region have started to decrease again, with the region reporting 76,000 new cases this week, an 8% decrease compared to last week. And the other regional metrics are improving as well, with positivity rates, hospitalization rates, and fatality rates all continuing to decline. Further, the regional forecast continues to expect cases to decline over the next few weeks as well, all of which is good news for Vermont. Looking at the national numbers, we see continued improvement overall, with cases clearly back on the decline after a short stall seven to 10 days ago. Cases are down 15% over the last 10 days, and national hospitalizations and deaths are also decreasing, with hospitalizations down 15% over the last 10 days and deaths down 14% over that same period. And finally, with the first confirmed case of the COVID variant B117 identified in Vermont, we did want to show uh, the rise in this reported variant across the country over the past few months uh, from CDC data. Just to let it serve as a good reminder that even with all of the positive information we're seeing in our case data, that the threat of the virus is certainly still real. And uh, we need to do everything we can to protect ourselves and our communities by following the public health guidance and getting vaccinated when it's our turn. And at this time, I'll turn it over to Secretary Smith. Thank you, Commissioner Pichek. Good morning, everyone. As I mentioned last week, we started vaccinating new groups yesterday. They included public safety, the education community, those 55 and older with high-risk conditions. As a result of these efforts and others planned for next week, more than 110,000 people will be eligible to register for a vaccine. As of 9 a.m. this morning, among those 55 years old and older with high-risk conditions, as the governor mentioned, more than 9,000 people have made appointments. 8,600 teachers and school staff have also made appointments uh, since yesterday. Next Monday, we are scheduled to open up uh, 16 and above with the high-risk conditions, but given our supply of vaccine and ability to accommodate large numbers of appointments, we have decided to accelerate this time schedule to this Thursday. So beginning at 8.15 a.m. this Thursday, those 16 years old and above with high-risk conditions can make an appointment to be vaccinated by going to the state website, healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine, or by calling the Vaccine Call Center at 855-722-7878. Again, at 815 on Thursday, those 16 and above with high-risk conditions can make an appointment to be vaccinated. Licensed child care providers will continue to be eligible to make appointments on Monday, March 15th, and those clinics, those clinics available to teachers and school staff will be available to regulated um, licensed child care programs too. They will also be eligible to avail themselves of Walgreens appointments as well. Just a reminder, although teachers and school staff and child care providers have been given instructions on how to register, these groups can make an appointment through the state system with an educator's vaccination clinic when it has been scheduled and they can make an appointment at Walgreens and bring their confirmation email to their appointment. The state website is healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine and Walgreens is walgreens.com. We are working to ensure there, there are vaccination sites in each district over the next few weeks. While they have instructions, some educators may not see sites near them in the system to make appointments at this time. We appreciate your patience as more sites are scheduled. As I said on Friday and, and previously, this will begin to ramp up pretty fast. Please choose a location near your home. So far, we have scheduled the following counties for next week. Addison, uh, Bennington, Caledonia, Chittenden, Rutland, and Wyndham. Uh, Department of Corrections staff, uh, in Burlington, St. Johnsbury, Rutland, and Springfield locations have been offered vaccine and have completed their appointments. 
I really cannot express enough appreciation for the EMS teams that continue to support a successful vaccination program across our state. They've been wonderful um, partners in this effort to vaccinate each and every one uh, in this state. They will start and complete the next round this week at St. Albans and Newport. Just to give an overall progress, um, as of today, 127,500 people have been vaccinated against COVID-19. 58,500 have received their first dose of vaccine. 68,900 have received their first and last dose. I just checked this morning, we're closing in on 200,000 doses of vaccine given to Vermonters. Areas with additional vaccine appointments. Uh, I just want to spend a few words about vaccine appointments. As you know, our goal is to make it easier for Vermonters to get vaccinated as soon as possible for the next six days. We are adding additional vaccine appointments in the towns of Grand Isle, Colchester, Essex Junction, Derby, Island Pond, Randolph, and Hartford. If you would like to reschedule for an earlier appointment, please call the Vaccine Call Center at 855-722-7878. Once again, thank you for all that you do to help protect yourself, your loved ones, and your community. And now I'll turn it over to Dr. Levine for a health update. Thank you. This morning I'm going to talk about a number of topics, including sports, the variant, the CDC, wastage, and vaccination of the BIPOC community. Today we're reporting 87 cases, 30 people in the hospital, including seven in the ICU with a seven-day average positivity rate of 1.7%. We're continuing to monitor spread in Franklin County and Stowe, where we were able to offer additional COVID testing opportunities last week and over this past weekend. We encourage people in those areas and across the state to take advantage of regular test sites, which you can find on our website, healthvermont.gov testing. Remember, testing is still a critical tool to finding cases and stopping further spread. With all the excitement and anticipation of vaccination, it is so easy for the fundamentals like testing to be forgotten or to feel that they are no longer relevant. We also continue to see cases affecting workplaces, healthcare and childcare facilities and schools. Sometimes cases in schools do affect sports teams and we typically don't see spread to multiple other players. We have seen a situation involving hockey again recently, but we don't know if it's a result of play or other factors such as carpooling or gathering. Or perhaps if a player just acquired the virus because it was in the community or their own household and was infectious on the day of a practice or a game. Importantly, these types of situations do lead to students quarantining, which is definitely challenging, but they do not typically disrupt in-school learning. These instances just occurred in the past 10 days, and there were not significant problems before then in hockey since we allowed competition. Likewise, we have noticed isolated instances of basketball players with COVID, but remarkably little disruption to team activities. You heard yesterday that we officially now have discovered the B117 variant in Vermont. We've expected this result for a while as it's been discovered in virtually every state now and mutations discovered in Burlington wastewater had already pointed to the likelihood it was here. So what does this mean? We don't need to change what we do to stop the spread of COVID, but this variant is easier to transmit so we need to make sure we're fully committed to those prevention measures. You already know them, but remember you can make them even stronger by doing things like making sure your mask is well-fitting or double-masking. 
and definitely avoiding indoor crowded situations. The good news is that the data shows that current vaccines are effective against this variant strain, and Vermonters should have confidence in the vaccines available. So get vaccinated when you're eligible, and in the meantime, help protect your fellow Vermonters by wearing your mask, keeping your distance, and avoiding crowds. The other big news from yesterday was CDC's guidance for people who have been fully vaccinated. I was happy to see it really shows Vermont is again, one, once again, ahead of the curve when it comes to deliberate easing of guidelines while still maintaining important protections like mask protocols. This guidance includes, you can stay indoors with fully vaccinated people without wearing a mask or staying six feet apart if you are vaccinated. You can gather indoors with unvaccinated people from one other household, for example, visiting with relatives who all live together without masks, unless any of those people or anyone they live with is at an increased risk for severe illness for COVID-19. If you've been around someone who has COVID-19, you do not need to stay away from others or get tested or quarantined unless you have symptoms, with some exceptions. But vaccinated people should still take steps to protect yourself and others in many situations, like wearing a mask, staying at least six feet apart, and avoiding crowds whenever you are in public, gathering with unvaccinated people from more than one other household, which in Vermont you should not be doing anyways, and visiting with an unvaccinated person who's at increased risk of severe illness or death from COVID or who lives with a person who's at increased risk. Again, this all agrees with what we've laid out in our easing of gathering restrictions to allow Vermonters more freedom while keeping them safe. I should note finally that CDC did not make any changes to its travel guidance or recommending against medium or large size gatherings, even of vaccinated people. There's another area of good news that I also want to highlight because there is a need to provide a little more context. As we've been putting thousands of doses of vaccine in people's arms and scheduling appointments for tens of thousands more, I've heard concerns about what is often called wastage. This is the amount of vaccine dosage that are not or could not be used. As of today, Vermont has had 458 non-viable or wasted doses, which accounts for 0.2%, a small fraction of all doses, well below the CDC's recommended standard of less than 5%. Our COVID-19 vaccine wastage rate to date is comparable to or lower than other routinely recommended vaccines. And that is what the number of challenges unique to the COVID-19 vaccines, including the time limits on use. There are always errors that result in a lost dose, including accidents, problems with equipment, as well as issues with planning. But I want to make it very clear, there's no person, program, or facility that wants a single dose to go unused. Everyone involved, from the depot team who received the federal shipments, to the person giving you your shot is committed to vaccinating every person who can be vaccinated. As more doses become available, we are committed to working together to improve and ensure the systems are in place to minimize wastage and keeping our rates as low or lower than they already are. And finally, I'd like to briefly outline some plans for another group we have prioritized for vaccination Vermonters who are black, indigenous, and people of color. As we've said many times here, our data shows that BIPOC Vermonters are more likely to get COVID-19 compared to white, non-Hispanic Vermonters. They are overrepresented among COVID-19 cases in the state, making up 6% of the population, but 18% of positive cases. They have significantly higher hospitalization rates and rates of most chronic diseases, often related to issues of higher exposure to COVID due to types of employment or public transportation issues. They are also more likely, 54%, to be part of an outbreak 
than white non-Hispanic Vermonters, 22%. BIPOC Vermonters are more likely, 46%, to have had a household contact with a case than white non-Hispanic, 19%, and are more likely to be living in multi-generational households. We are working with community organizations to try to rebuild the trust in public health that has eroded through historical injustices and to expand access to education and outreach. But we are seeing significant disparities in the rate of vaccination among BIPOC Vermonters compared to white non-Hispanic Vermonters. We have listened to our BIPOC community partners about the kinds of approaches that would work for them and have learned that some element of prioritization is one pathway that may contribute to greater uptake of the vaccine. Yet our priority schemes to date, which emphasize older age and residents in a long-term care facility, do not always help this population due to the lower likelihood of living in such facilities or in having sufficient life expectancy. For example, compared to 20% of white Vermonters who've received at least one dose of vaccine, only 3.8% of indigenous Vermonters, 9% of black Vermonters, and 11% of multiracial Vermonters have received the vaccine. We can and must do better, not only in engagement, the building of trust in reducing vaccine hesitancy, but in realizing better health outcomes. Our goal to achieve community immunity and to protect all Vermonters can only be achieved if we work to lessen the barriers and make vaccination equitably accessible to all groups of Vermonters. Over the past month, we've been holding vaccine clinics for eligible Vermonters and members of their household who are among the groups at higher risk for COVID-19 due to language barriers, such as English language, English, English language learners. Beginning next week and over the ensuing weeks, we plan to continue and extend that strategy to other BIPOC communities where an eligible Vermonter who meets the age category, for example, may also bring other household members to be vaccinated. This will be statewide and not only in Chittenden County, from our southern border to mid-state farm workers to indigenous Vermonters in the northern part of the state. Clinics will be arranged in coordination and with the support of community partners around the state. As we establish clinic locations, we will post information on our website at healthvermont.gov. I want to thank all of the individuals and our community partners and leaders who have provided us with the supports needed to meet this important aspect of our public health mission. Governor. Thank you, Dr. Levine. Uh, we'll now open it up to questions. All right, we'll start with Calvin. Um, thank you, Governor. So uh, Commissioner Pichek touched upon the data aspect of this, but why do you feel comfortable uh, this coming Friday lifting, gathering, or loosening gathering restrictions, uh, especially as cases are on the rise and we're seeing the variant? Yeah, again, I, I think if you look back at the cases on the rise, um, if you look at one in particular, uh, the outbreak, at the correctional facility, and, and that did skew the numbers a bit. Um, but overall, um, we've we've done fairly well. Uh, the amount of hospitalizations is coming down, number of deaths is coming down, uh, and we're moving in the right direction. We're, spring is upon us. Uh, people will be getting outside more, and, and I think that this is an opportunity to continue to do what we think is, is enough in terms of um, allowing a more, uh, less restrictive, uh, guidance uh, as we move forward, um, because the you know we do see light at the end of the tunnel, and and I believe that uh, this is the right step forward. So we'll do it in a methodical and very disciplined way. But um, this is just one one small step, and we'll continue to make uh, steps all along uh, the way. And uh, second question for Dr. Levine. You know, you you mentioned and Secretary Smith said that uh, vaccine uptake uh, and signing up for the vaccine for um, Vermonters with underlying conditions, it's been uh, a little slower than, than the state had hoped. Um, why, what, what are you hearing and why are people hesitant to sign up for the vaccine? I'm just wondering maybe does it have something to do with 
you know, whether people can't choose what type of vaccine um, they get at this point, or I just, what, what are you seeing? What, what are the reasons so far? Yeah, I think we're um, pretty optimistic on the teacher side that those are pretty solid numbers that we saw on the teachers and school staff side. On the, on the um, high-risk condition side, I think we got to give it a little bit more time. Um, you know, a lot of these people are working, um, so that may be some of the issues that uh, we want to make sure that we give it just a little bit more time. With that said, I mean, 9,000 people, 10,000, just under, you know, 10,000 people is a, is a lot. That's a lot of people. And so, you know, let's give it a couple more days, but we feel comfortable now that we've opened up registration here that we can open up registration for the other group um, uh, quicker as well. So uh, I would, I think Calvin, as I'm, I'm repeating myself, I think just give it a few more days. I guess then why, why move up the, um, uh, 50, or the 18 to 55, why, why move that deadline up? If we're just kind well, of we have the vaccine and we have the registration capability to do it. So, and we have the slot, so why not? Uh, is the question. You know, a lot of these people have been w waiting a long time for vaccine. So, you know, let's get them slotted. Let's get them scheduled. Let's get, let's get vaccine uh, out there to people. Thanks. Steve? Uh, Mike, since you're there. <laughs> um, in signing up for the, or the lack of uh, the pace that you thought you might get, is it possible that this is pointing towards maybe a little problem with the uh with the website itself and the process of signing up going through quite a few layers quite frankly about yeah you know i i, I don't think so steve because we've never seen this in the you know the website's been up for a while and we've gone through multiple bands 75 plus 70 to 75 65 up and we've had solid numbers along the way i still think you know we're starting to run Many of those people that we've already vaccinated and already signed up obviously are retired or near retirement, maybe have a little bit more time to sign up. Uh, but we haven't run into those. I don't think it's the website that's causing the, the issue. And I just, I don't want to under, I don't want to overemphasize this because I don't think it, it's true. I, I just think it's, we're going to see the uptick differently than we saw the uptick on on other age groups uh and uh maybe for dr levine some people are pushing back on uh, the travel guidance uh that's been issued by cdc uh specifically i think the airline industry um uh, your thoughts on possibly air travel and relaxing you know our every state is doing something different here as far as travel <clears throat> and, and the reason for that, Steve, is because the CDC generally deals more with international travel than domestic travel. So the pushback probably is because they're being pretty meticulous about the international travel with regard to vaccination, with regard to testing, and making sure that people are not bringing yet another variant into this country. Uh, domestic travel is a whole different ballgame, obviously, as we know. Um, and Though they don't weigh in as much on it, uh, I think there will be some emphasis on that in future iterations of what they come out with. Uh, because I do think it is a little um, chaotic to have every state sort of make their own decision and come up with their own plan, whether it be about vaccination, about testing protocols, et cetera. Uh, there should be an ability to have some consensus about this. Uh, but we'll have to wait and see. Is it? Is it uh is it in the future that we're going to carry a, some sort of a travel card or something like that to be presented at a at a at a airline gate? The, the, the Biden administration is actually looking at that right as we speak, uh, and, and getting quite serious about that. There's lots of uh, potential benefits, and there's some pitfalls, so it has to be done very carefully. But in the meantime, we all can have a card when we get vaccinated that says we've been vaccinated. So we should not throw that away. We should make sure we keep that with us because it will come in very handy as these decisions are made. Uh, I just wanted to add another answer to Calvin's question about moving up the registration and all that. You know, the goal here is to get all Vermonters vaccinated as quickly as possible. So anything we can do to push that along is gonna be a benefit. 
And maybe we'll find there are more thousands in the 55 down to 16 age group than we thought, so that the total number will still add up to a number that we were expecting all along. We'll just have to see. Thank you. If, if I could just add a couple of things uh, as well. You know, that was an estimate that we had of 75,000 of that age band, 16 uh, to 65, with uh, certain health conditions. Uh, and we don't know about the demographics. It could be a shift. Uh, so we, we were going to open it up the entire age band all at once, uh, 16 to 65. But then we thought uh, if there were a number of people uh, in the, the first age group, um, we didn't want to overwhelm the system. And we wanted to take care of them uh, because we know age is a factor in terms of hospitalization and death. So we wanted to make sure we got to those folks first uh, and, um, but we didn't know what to expect uh, in, the, in the broader group. So opening up sooner uh, is not going to impact us in any way uh, because we'll continue to, to vaccinate uh, those uh, Vermonters overall. I mean, that is our goal. Uh, in terms, of, I just want to go back as well to the travel policy uh, because I just want to reiterate uh, that we did open it up to Vermonters can travel in and out of the state uh, with, uh, after they've been fully vaccinated. So, and that includes air travel as well. Matt, NBC5. Thank you. Um, good morning. Governor Scott, kind of just going off that travel guidance, um, I believe it was last week, uh, Maine Governor Janet Mills um, kind of opened up travel for all New England. I mean, do you have any plans in the future to open up travel for those who are not vaccinated yet or going back to that former, um, that kind of county by county map we had um, late last year? Yeah, there's, there's a number of initiatives that are on the table and we're having those conversations uh, amongst our team. And uh, you can expect that we will uh, be having, we'll be updating uh, that policy in the near future. But as Dr. Levine has said repeatedly, March is a critical month uh, for us here in Vermont and for our country, as a matter of fact. So we need to pay attention until we, until we know exactly as well uh, how much supply we're going to get from the federal government, which uh, includes mostly uh, the Johnson & Johnson uh, allotment, uh, and, and they're able to tell us exactly what we're going to get. Uh, I'm, we're a little bit hesitant uh, as to making uh, huge changes uh, at this point in time. Uh, but I will say uh, that uh, by the end of the month, uh, first week in April, uh, between now and then, uh, you can expect uh, that we will have more detailed uh, plans in terms of showing you exactly how much uh, of the, the vaccination bans and so forth and our strategy in detail, uh, what you can expect throughout uh, the exit. Uh, as well, uh, soon after that, we will uh, we'll be able to outline and uh, give the details as to what our exit strategy is as well. Um, so uh, stay tuned for that, uh, be patient. Uh, but, uh, but we have it all um, mapped out, and we think it's a solid plan. Um, but, um, but we need this other piece of the puzzle, and, and mainly that supply from the federal government and a commitment uh, that they will be able to supply us with the vaccinations that we think are needed in order to, uh, to initiate our plan. So stay tuned. Peace, be when patient. Yeah. When when it comes to teachers being eligible for the vaccine, are substitute teachers also eligible to receive a vaccine? I, in this be new I believe category? that is the case. Is that the case? I'm getting uh, head shakes, and yes, they are a part of that. Anyone who is uh, engaged in the uh, within the footprint of the uh, of the building. Great. Thank you very much. Aaron BT Digger. Hi. I uh, I have a question about the um, eligibility of out-of-staters getting the vaccine in Vermont. Um, Tracy Dolan kind of suggested or, or seems to be saying that there's been a recent change in eligibility for those people. So I'd just like to know exactly who is eligible and how that's changed in the past weeks or months. Uh, specifically, you know, out-of-staters work here versus people who maybe get primary care here or other things that would qualify you to get the vaccine. Yeah, I'll let Secretary Smith answer that, but we do have an agreement 
uh, with New Hampshire, for instance, on uh, the vaccination of uh, the education system. Uh, they're a little behind us in that regard, but we are moving forward and uh, we are going to be uh, vaccinating some uh, from New Hampshire uh, who teach in our schools. Secretary Smith. Thanks, Aaron, um, and, and thank you for asking the question. I did reach out to uh, your organization to, to provide some clarification on a story. Um, the story had said that, that, um, w that there wasn't any sort of reciprocal vaccination going on between Vermont and New Hampshire, and in fact, Dartmouth has uh, vaccinated 2,133 Vermonters. And, they're, I believe they're mostly healthcare workers living in Vermont and working at Dartmouth. Um, so I just want, I want to clarify that because there's been some confusion. Also, um, it, it, it mentioned a uh, out-of-staters being vaccinated at a figure of 6,400. It's actually 5,517, uh, and that's the 883 that are difference in that number are Vermonters whose addresses couldn't be found. Uh, just let's set the table on this. Uh, most of the out-of-staters vaccinated in Vermont come from the 1A category, healthcare workers, based upon the timing of their vaccination. As, as Dartmouth vaccinated Vermonters in their workforce, our hospitals and healthcare facilities vaccinated out-of-staters uh, that were in their workforce. Uh, New Hampshire and New York primarily, um, where the residents commuted to New York to work in healthcare, uh, commuted to Vermont to work in healthcare or long-term uh, care facilities. Now, this was essential uh, to keeping Vermont healthy, um, and particularly Vermonters healthy that needed to access healthcare in Vermont and keep a stable workforce in the healthcare field. Now, we, just so you, besides 1A, um, we had originally said when, um, uh, when we started, we used primary care as a criteria. Um, we had two criteria. One, you had to be a Vermonter, you had to work in Vermont, or three criteria. You had to be a Vermonter, you had to work in Vermont, you had to um, have primary care in Vermont. And the primary reason we put primary care in there is because older age band individuals were most likely to be hospitalized and occupying Vermont hospital beds. So uh, primary care was there. And as the age bands get younger, this eligibility will be eliminated and, and is being eliminated. So besides 1A, where each state, uh, particularly Vermont and New Hampshire, have demonstrated uh, that we do reciprocate in the healthcare fields. It's also anticipated that we'll do the same for teachers and school staff, as the governor had just mentioned, and child care providers, where we will vaccinate their residents that work in Vermont, and they will do the same uh, for Vermont residents that work in New Hampshire. As a result, um, working in Vermont will be defined to mean these areas, healthcare, public safety, childcare, teachers, and school staff, so that we eliminate any confusion that we have with border, bordering states. Is, does that answer your question? Yeah, so just so that I can nail this down exactly, um, you said that the, the primary care eligibility is kind of being eliminated. So is anyone currently eligible for a vaccine um, included in that group? Anybody, uh, are are any, people who are like any, 65 anybody, and older? Yeah, anybody that has signed up and registered, and that's probably 65 and older by now, um, is eligible, but we have cut it off um, as of the other day. Um, so people 55 plus with high risk conditions would not be able to get an out-of-state vaccine? No. If they were an out-of-state or okay. with high-risk conditions, they would not be eligible to get a vaccine. Okay, thanks. Thanks for clarifying. Um, do you, you know, this is kind of a, a second question, but do you feel that as eligibility expands to these different kind of groups, that there may be kind of confusion about who is eligible and when those new eligibility periods start? I feel like most of the media coverage around the expanded eligibility last week 
focused on teachers now qualifying, um, do you think perhaps that the um, high-risk conditions news may have been kind of buried by that discussion or, or that media coverage? Um, perhaps. Um, but I think we've been pretty clear on, you know, as I've, as I pointed out to your organization, pretty clear of what, what we're doing and what we're, what we're saying. I was pretty explicit in an email on this. I mean, I was talking more, more broadly, um, about the, the new eligibility periods and the thing that you mentioned with, uh, you know, a lo lower number than expected of people with high risk conditions signing up. That was obviously, um, you know, kind of not uh, premeditated. You know, that was a, 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 not a last second change, but a very quick change from previous statements about eligibility. So do you think it's possible there was kind of confusion around who is now eligible to get the vaccine? Yeah, it's possible. I don't think so. I mean, you get onto the website, it basically will let you know what um, what eligibility criteria there is. So, you know, out-of-staters with, um, with these high-risk conditions um, uh, that, you know, the only thing that's changed is now if you have your primary care in Vermont, you're not eligible uh, in those lower age bands. And secondly, if, um, you know, that's, that was the change and, and we'll move forward forward with that. Yeah, I mean, again, I was just I was speaking about you know Vermonters, you know, in general, not necessarily. If, if Vermont, um, if Vermont, know. just so we're clear, we're clear here. If Vermonters, it doesn't affect Vermonters at all. It affects only out-of-staters. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. And what's, what's the question yeah, with high yeah. risk? Well, you said that there were fewer than expected high risk Vermonters signing up to get, get the vaccine. And I was wondering if you'd considered that maybe the news about them qualifying now has been kind of lost in the fray. Um, because there have been, you know, many, yeah. many new periods yeah. of eligibility opening up yeah. very quickly. Um, I, I, you know, I, this is a bit of a change from your previous language about how yeah. people qualify and, and things like that. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, Erin. You're, you're absolutely right. It probably has been lost in the fray on that. Um, there's been a lot going on. We're opening up to a lot of people, as I said, 100, you know, over 110,000 Vermonters. So you're, you're absolutely right on that. I think probably it may have been lost in the fray. So let's, let's be clear. Those that are 55 and above with high risk conditions can sign up for vaccine starting, it was starting on Monday. And those that are 16 and older um, with high risk conditions can sign up on Thursday, just to be clear. But I'm sorry, I, mis I, uh, I misheard your question. And I, I, I think maybe with a lot of this, um, with a lot that we've been doing and opening it up to a lot of, a, a lot of groups, um, this is uh, something that could have been uh, lost. I will say this, and the governor has said this, we're looking at getting back to age ban, which makes things a lot easier after we get through these groups. Okay, thank you. Yep. Wilson, the AP. Uh, hi, good morning, everybody. I'm kind of curious, the, uh, the surge you see, I don't know if the surge is the right word here, but the increase in cases over the last week, you don't seem terribly concerned by that. Um, and I think just wondering, I mean, I heard all the good news that everyone was talking about earlier, but... Uh, isn't this concerning that these cases are going up like this? And it seems that over the last month or maybe six weeks, the number of the, the counties with the increase in cases have kind of moved uh, counterclockwise around the state as you started in Bennington and then moved north and has now seemed to be heading east. And I was just wondering, is there any common theme here? And uh, am, am I incorrect in thinking you don't seem too concerned about it? Well, for, first of all, Wilson, we're concerned about every case and every death. Um, but um, 
but the deaths are a lagging indicator. Um, so when you see uh, three or four or five weeks ago, uh, the high number of cases we had, um, we have to, to assume that there may be deaths associated with that. Uh, having said that, um, we, uh, we have seen as well, uh, due to, we believe, vaccinations of those in those high-risk categories, and then coming into uh, uh, fully uh, being uh, the efficacy of the vaccination process coming into play, uh, that we're going to see fewer deaths, and we have seen fewer deaths. So, and and as well, you know, we have a very small population, obviously here in Vermont. And and again, when you see the the cases, and maybe the average age of the cases, uh, are starting to drop as well, just because we've fully vaccinated those in the higher risk categories. So, um, we're concerned, uh, but it seems to be at least steady and level, and. Uh, and we do feel that our strategy, as we continue uh, to, to vaccinate those uh, by age band after we get through this high risk category, will be beneficial to the state. And we'll continue to see um, no, you know, no escalation maybe of the, uh, the cases, um, but uh, the death rate is what we've been, hospitalization and death rate is what we've been watching. Uh, okay, thank you. Anything to add, Dr. Levine or Commissioner Pichet? Dr. Levine? Just a <coughs> quick comment. So obviously, you're looking at it as an increase in cases around the state, and I don't think the data that Commissioner Pichet showed really indicates that. It's really leveled off in a 100 to 100 teens kind of uh, seven-day average of cases. Um, but I will echo what Dr. Walensky of the CDC has said. The country has leveled off at about 69, 70,000 cases a day. Uh, and that's why they have not gone hog wild with their current guidance and recommendations and are strongly arguing against uh, the states who have opened things up completely just because it seemed like the time was right. So the cautious and more deliberate approach that they've taken and that we in Vermont have taken um, respects the fact that there are these uh, leveled off numbers of cases uh, and the unknowns about the variants. But it doesn't mean uh, that necessarily we're concerned that things are gonna get much worse because as you've seen, the groups that have been getting vaccinated are actually doing much, much better. Commissioner Pichek has an addition as well. Yeah, thanks for the question, Wilson. I just want to make two points. One, you know, you saw um, last week that the cases in the region, you know, were increasing, and this week that trend has reversed. And through both last week and this week, the forecasting is anticipating that cases will go down. So, um, you know, I think you need more data to see if this is a, a change in trajectory or just sort of a, you know, stalling. Um, but I think more importantly is when you look at those individuals that are the most vulnerable by age that we showed in the presentation, even though cases are going up in Vermont generally, they're going down and they're staying uh, down. They're, they're low and they're continuing to decrease among those that are 70 and older. And if you have fewer cases among that age group, you're going to have fewer hospitalizations and fewer deaths. So I think that's primarily why we're so uh, optimistic. Uh, okay, great. Thank you all very much. And again, Wilson, uh, I think every, every time I see a report uh, that comes in in the middle of the night from uh, Secretary Smith, um, I breathe a sigh of relief when it's under 100, and yesterday it was, I think, 87. Um, so that uh, that's good news as well. We're starting to see, uh, hopefully, uh, a trend, a downward trend. But, uh, but again, anything under 100 was uh, positive news from my standpoint. Okay, thank you. Mike Donahue, the Islander. Thanks. <clears throat> thanks, Rebecca, and thanks to Secretary Smith for following up from last Friday. Uh, Governor, <clears throat> following up on last Friday's issue about where there was no communication between the state of Vermont and the Veterans Administration hosting a first-come, first-served clinic at the Essex Fairgrounds when the state was having its own clinic there. Secretary Smith did correctly note that communication is a two-way street. I'm just wondering about Vermont's side of the street. Since last Friday, is any leader in the health department 
or any leaders on behalf of the state, picked up the phone, reached out to the VA leaders to start any sort of communication about COVID in the state. I mean, does the VA have extra vaccines that it could share and help speed up vaccination in Vermont? Does the Vermont, does Vermont actually know uh, how many people have been vaccinated by the VA? Does that impact the numbers and the percentages that you keep, that the state keeps listing? I mean, what has the state learned since Friday? Um, I would say yes. Uh, we have been in communication with the VA uh, in terms of uh, trying to make sure that we uh, are in the loop, so to speak, whenever they do this again. Uh, and they, uh, uh, I think we had advised that they might want to go to some sort of a appointment system, and it appears they will on their next, uh, the next time that they do this. Um, so I believe um, we receive the, all the information from them in terms of those uh, vaccinated with uh, Vermonters vaccinated. But I might ask either Secretary Smith, maybe Secretary Smith can answer that. If there's if they're Vermonters, we receive the information that they've been vaccinated. So we we make sure that uh, uh, we understand who's been vaccinated and and try to inter, in, um, try to make sure that we um, have a relationship with them. I think I think we just the one thing that you pointed out, Mike, is that am I correct on that? In Okay, Dr. Dr. Levine's going to get more technical with you, Michael, on how that works. But the, the one thing that we've learned is, and I said this, this is a two-way street. I wish the VA had reached out to us. You know, you surprised the governor and myself with this uh, news on uh, Friday. Um, they had not reached out to either my office or to the governor's office about this. Um, I think they've learned a few things. You need an appointment system. I think I saw on the news somebody said, you know, they should run it like the state does with an appointment system. I think we would advise them to do that in the future. I don't think we should sort of mix uh, areas as well. I think you'll see the VA system uh, being run a lot more efficiently the next time they do this. Um, and we will continue to work out, uh, work with them uh, as they move forward. I'm going to ask Dr. Levine to make a correction if I said something uh, wrong here. So just uh, go ahead, Dr. Levine. Just two quick points. Uh, number one, through no fault of local VA people, but this is a national issue, uh, when it was decided the VA would be doing vaccine for uh, its veterans, um, they have a separate record system, and um, there was no requirement uh, for them to actually tie in with any other state record system. Um, and we had numerous communications, actually, with White River Junction during that time period, and this was much more of a federal mandate kind of thing that occurred uh, that they didn't have a lot of control over. But uh, that complicated life, needless to say. The second point is on the day of the infamous clinic that you're referring to, um, we were notified by a number of people about the um, lack of orderliness about how vaccine was happening, uh, lack of distancing while people were waiting in line, uh, not, a, not a real organization of that. And, uh, when the moment we found that out, one of my deputy commissioners was on the phone with the person running the clinic, and quickly we learned from people who were in the lines, uh, things got, got much more orderly. So it became a much more safe experience for those veterans as well in terms of adhering to usual public health guidance. Yeah, no, I, I heard it was, and I know the VA has done really good work Apparently down at their hospital, but yeah, being out on the road, I, I'm not sure it was good. The first person in line uh, waited for quite a while, finally got a card that said he was number 266. So uh, there were some problems, uh, I guess, on, uh, clearly on their end and everything like that. But, uh, and I also understand you guys may not want to share your records with the VA, and the VA probably equally doesn't want to share all their medical records with the state of Vermont. So it, it's a little dicey trying to have only one person in charge. My other question, 
uh, as a follow-up uh, to Secretary Smith uh, on gaming the system, one of his favorite uh, topics, I'm sure. Um, we did have an inquiry from uh, uh, a teacher who uh, questions how uh, apparently the school districts have specific codes for signing up for the vaccine as an educator, and she's thinking that the code is there anything to prevent the code from being shared with friends and family? Essentially, could a husband of a teacher also use that, go in and sign up, or as the state come up with some sort of system to block that kind of gaming of the system? Yeah, we're monitoring that. Um, that wasn't lost on us when we were putting this forward, uh, but we had to come up with a system that was... Uh, uh, something that was uh, at least um, usable and uh, understandable and efficient. So uh, we're going to monitor this and make uh, any adjustments we need to make. Uh, but we're looking for just just what you're talking about, and we'll see how it goes. We're hoping uh, people don't abuse the system, um, but as we know, it happens. And and our goal again uh, is to make sure that we vaccinate as many Vermonters as possible. But uh, we want them to wait their turn in order to do so. But by monitoring it, uh, does that mean like the school district will get a list of who supposedly signed up within that district? And so if a name shows up as a husband or a spouse or grandparent yeah. or somebody or a friend. Yeah, it's not as though we don't know. The school superintendent yeah. is going to be able to. Right. It's not as though we don't know the school who. superintendent is going to be able to. It's Sorry, not, yeah, it's not as though we don't know who's in the system. I mean, that's a defined list. So we will try and correlate the two. Uh, the, my fear is that we do it, it's too late in some respects um, because we're doing this in, uh, in rapid fire. I mean, we've already started uh, vaccinating uh, the uh, school staff and uh, we've done a number of them already this week. So uh, this will continue and we, want to, we don't want to slow that up. Uh, we don't want the... Uh, uh, the perfect to be the enemy of the good here. Uh, we want to make sure that we get as many of the vaccinations in the arms of the school staff as possible so we can get kids back in school. That's what we that's our goal. And uh, because we know it's better for our kids because our kids aren't doing okay. So uh, we'll do what we can uh, to tighten up the system as needed. Uh, but as of yet, we haven't seen anything uh, that would cause us um, uh, any, any, um, cause of us any concern, uh, but that doesn't mean it's not happening, and we acknowledge that, but uh, we're going to do everything we can to make sure that doesn't happen. And, and just to be clear on the, the relations with the VA, <clears throat> is there going to be ongoing, regular, daily communications with the VA, or every other day, or what, did, what was the agreement as far as well, keeping the doors of communication for Yeah, I mean, we have a good relationship with the VA. Um, we're all on the same team here. Uh, we all have the same goals. Uh, but they have their mission. It's with the Department of Defense, and they have uh, their supply that comes to them. And they are doing what they're supposed to do is to vaccinate uh, veterans. Uh, when they have something of this uh, scale, and when they have something where they're uh, inviting people Without registering, uh, without telling us, and, and I, I'm not, and I'm saying us, the administration, uh, they may have uh, coordinated with others, but not with our administration. Uh, so, we would advise uh, when they do so in the future, uh, just let us know. We'll help out in any way we can. Uh, but this, I think, this is uh, why I'm concerned in some respects with the, even with the pharmacies and and some of the contracts that the federal government has directly with the pharmacies uh, and as well with the Department of Defense, uh, it, we lack, we're losing control in some respects. And we're a small state. I can't imagine what's happening in other states. Um, so uh, it would be my preference if we were to get the supply of vaccine into our uh, central supply, and then we could distribute it from there to the pharmacies and so forth. And that way we at least know what's going on. Um, we don't always know uh, when the federal government is involved uh, what uh, what actually transpires. So uh, this is just another case uh, of that uh, situation. But we want to uh, do everything we can uh, to help the VA and make sure that they fulfill their mission of vaccinating those who 
uh, uh, served and protected us uh, through many, many generations. So we want to, uh, to help them in any way we can. Hey, thank you very much. Thank and you very much. We're at about 12.15, and we still have 15 in the queue. Uh, so just a reminder to the folks on your question limit. Uh, Lisa, the Valley Reporter. Hi there. This question is probably for Dr. Levine. Since kids can't get vaccinated, are kids sim simply left out of the household gathering equation when vaccinated households get together with other vaccinated households? or an unvaccinated household? This question comes from a family of two educators with a 10-year-old daughter wanting to know if their unvaccinated daughter could visit her unvaccinated friend in a house with vaccinated parents. Your vaccinated daughter can visit her vaccinated- Unvaccinated daughter. Unvaccinated daughter. The children daughter. are unvaccinated because they can't get vaccinated right now. Yeah, so the answer is no. Today. Okay. But that may change. Uh, okay, so thank you. My next question over is time, that may Secretary... change. Okay, thanks. My other question is for Secretary Smith or Secretary French on school-based vaccination clinics. Are they primarily for staff in that district, or can educators from any district make appointments in any district where a vaccine clinic is being held? We had one that will be held tomorrow at our local school district, and some local educators couldn't get registered were concerned that other educators from other districts had taken those slots. What's the policy on that? I'll, um, I'll, I'll let Secretary French um, comment on that. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, you are, you are correct, uh, particularly on these initial sites, that uh, they're open to any educator. Um, and that was a function to a certain extent of our, you know, the, the early uh, sites that we stood up. So, but we'll look to refine that. But it is also, uh, as the governor mentioned, in our interest to vaccinate as many as possible. So we're, our, sort of our response to that is to continue to expand the number of clinics that are being offered with the attempt to uh, ensure there's good access for everyone. Thank you very much. Howard, VPR. Thanks. Now that Congress has done its work for the next stimulus bill, um, do you have any more information? And, uh, you know, what's your message to business owners, to um, communication union districts, um, you know, to the folks, uh, municipalities who are looking to get the next round of federal money? Any idea um, the timeline there? Yeah, thanks very much. Um, Congress hasn't actually uh, finished their work. Uh, the the a house has not uh, taken action. I think they'll be taking action tomorrow. As a matter of fact, it was put off today, uh, and they'll be taking a final vote tomorrow. Uh, we are actively uh, trying to go through the bill uh, to figure out it's a big bill, uh, and there's a lot of uh, complexity to it, and uh, trying to get to the details to understand what it really will mean to us. But we're learning every day. Um, my. Uh, I guess my message uh, to businesses is as soon as we are, are confident in, in what we can do and what we can't do, we'll be working with the legislature to get this money out the door uh, to help them because we know that they're struggling, in particular in the hospitality sector. Um, so we'll do what we can as quick as we can. Uh, but, but until you know the details are all um, unraveled and uh, we have a better understanding of that, I, I don't want to promise anything. Uh, as well, we know that there's a, uh, a lot of money in there for broadband, uh, and that's uh, very good news. It's something that's highest on uh, one of the high uh, uh, infrastructure needs that I think we have in this state, and uh, this is good news. And we um, are already moving forward with a bill uh, that I push, uh, put forward or had it as part of our budget, so uh, that looks like it's getting uh, momentum in the uh, in the legislature, uh, so this will just add to it, hopefully. Um, so, uh, again, too early to, to say exactly what it'll mean uh, for um, some of the um, some of those districts, uh, as well as uh, any provision within the bill. Um, but uh, we're, we see clarity uh, every single day. We're working on it as you speak. Do Do you expect lawmakers will be working on this through the summer? This is, um, again, one of the advantages that I 
of this bill, of this recovery package, is that it's not as tight a time frame as the first one we received. As you remember last year, uh, when we uh, received this money, it had to be committed by December 31st. Uh, this has, is, is uh, open for a number of years. Uh, I think it's two or three years, but I don't even know that for sure. Um, so that's good news, that flexibility in terms of timing will allow us to, uh, to be strategic. Um, I believe this is one-time money uh, that, uh, that isn't ongoing, so it shouldn't be used for, for program or programmatic needs. Uh, this should be used for unmet needs in terms of infrastructure, broadband in particular, but, but other areas, you know, stormwater, water, water systems, uh, any other infrastructure uh, that we uh, know uh, we are in great need of uh, could be we could utilize some of this these dollars for that and put a, you know strengthen our foundation so to speak for future generations so I'm I'm excited about this I think this is uh, great news and we'll uh, again be reporting this uh, as we know more about this and presenting uh, some of our thoughts and ideas uh, to the legislature as well and work with them. Um, so that we, uh, we get the, the most benefit, the best return on investment we possibly can for Vermonters and uh, not have any ongoing burden as a result of uh, funneling money into programs that we can't pay for in the future. All right, great, thank you. Joe, the Barton Chronicle. Hello, I've got a couple of questions about vaccinations. From readers, the first is from a gentleman who is 65 and has multiple sclerosis. Um, he has had problems with shots in the past and believes that the Johnson & Johnson vaccine would be his best choice and wants to know whether there's any way that he can make sure he gets that particular vaccine. Yeah, I, again... Uh, Joe, we're planning. Uh, to, I think people should have a choice uh, that this shouldn't be forced on anyone. Um, so we are uh, trying to have, uh, we're trying to develop a system uh, to make that possible. Uh, but we also need to know what our supply is. Um, so that's the uh, that's the missing piece of this puzzle. Uh, we haven't been able to um, acquire from the feds, and maybe this afternoon they'll give us uh, a little bit more guidance or insight as to what they're expecting. Uh, but until we know how much we're going to receive, it's going to be difficult for us to come up with a, a uh, plan in order to, to distribute. So we'll, time will tell. Uh, hopefully we'll have some more information on this in the, in the coming week or two. Um, great. Um, the second question is a little more complicated. I'll give that it's one to Dr. From... Levine then. Okay. Well, I'm sorry about that. No, go um, ahead. It's from a woman who got um, vaccinated at Walmart. She got the Moderna vaccine. She and her husband both did. Um, and their appointment for the second vaccination, she noted, was in one case 24, uh, five days later and one 26 days later. She is concerned because she knows that the recommended time is um, 28 days, and although she knows it's acceptable to have a shorter interlude, um, that's not what she says is it's not proper to use that um, ability to have a, a shorter time when scheduling. She contacted Walmart and they said they could not make uh, appointments beyond March 30th, which meant that uh, since she had gotten vaccinated um, less than, you know, uh, farther into the month than would have uh, allowed for a 28 gap to stay within that time. Uh, so she's concerned about that and wonders what the state's relationship is with Walmart and um, whether this is a problem or not. So this, rather than throw Walmart under the bus completely, this, this could happen at another pharmacy. This might even 
potentially happen at another uh, site in the state. Um, but forgetting that, the real question is the matter of timing. And you don't want timing to be a matter of convenience because of a scheduling system not able to accommodate uh, something beyond the end of the month. So if you got your vaccine on March 15th, you'd hate to hear that you were getting your second shot on March 30th, because that would be way too early. But by the same token, the conditions you just presented about this woman uh, and her husband, uh, which is really only a few days ahead of the 28 days, could also be a few days after the 28 days, that would really not uh, matter much. And uh, though the trials are done, trying to adhere to a specific schedule, and that becomes what we draw our clinical guidance from, um, everyone agrees that several days before or after is not uh, going to matter too much. The CDC has also weighed in and said that should you get your vaccine six weeks later, that's probably all right as well, but don't go beyond that point um, because we do want to try to adhere as closely as possible to the guidance that the trials provided us. Okay? Uh, yes, that's very clear. Thank you very much. I was reading a chart in the New York Times yesterday that tracks vaccinations by state. Um, one of the columns was percentage of doses used. In Vermont, it says we've used 76% of doses, which is a bit below um, the U.S. total of 79%. I'm wondering why that is. Um, are doses being thrown out at all? Has anything happened there? I'll let uh, Commissioner Pichak answer that. Yeah, thank you, Courtney, for the question. And I'll um, also let Secretary Smith add anything that he wants to add as well. But just a couple of things to keep in mind um, on that percent uh, used. I mean, when you look at the states that are leading in that category, um, eight out of the 10 states are, are behind Vermont when it comes to um, fully vaccinated as a percent of your population. So, you know, something is incongruent there in terms of the reporting and the data. Um, the states that are doing the best in terms of vaccinating their people uh, completely are not the ones necessarily leading on that percent use metric. And as I said, it's actually shown to work in the opposite way as well. I think for Vermont, the most important metrics are to look at the population that's had the vaccine available to them for the longest period of time, which is the 75 and older, and they're 70, there's 82 percent, and the national average is closer to 70 percent. So that's really uh, favorable in the long term. Um, also. You know, you look at the percent of the uptake of those that are unvaccinated that are willing to get it. And again, we're really high on that metric, too. So really, I think it comes down to more of a reporting anomaly uh, and an inventory management in a way that these states are using their inventory. West Virginia, a few weeks ago, put out a press release from their governor's office saying they had used over 100 percent of their vaccine. Um, today, they're at 83 percent. So states are really moving all around on, on that. And again, I think it boils down to more about how are they reporting it uh, and how are they um, you know, using their inventory in a way that may be uh, or maybe not be uh, responsible. Courtney, you also have got to look at uh, how states are doing first and second dose, and we're, we're starting to get reports that some states are using their second dose as their first dose. Um, so that will increase um, their percentage in that area. In Vermont, we don't do that. Um, we hold the second dose for the second dose. And, and I think many other states are, are doing that as well. But what you will find in some states, and, and it will catch up sooner or later to them, um, is that they're using second dose as first dose, hoping that the inventory will increase enough where they can keep going uh, on first and second dose. And, and again, we just don't do that here in Vermont. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm going to add one more layer of uh, suspicion from my standpoint. Um, we are a rural state. Um, we, if, if you've traveled in Florida, for instance, uh, there is a Walgreens or a CVS or something on every single corner uh, in every community. Uh, we don't have that in Vermont. 
Um, so we're uh, not in control of all of the inventory, some of, uh, and this is what I described earlier. Uh, we don't receive the doses. We don't distribute them to the pharmacies. The pharmacies are in control uh, of their own inventory. Uh, we actually found uh, that uh, one of the pharmacies we've been dealing with uh, was, has, was sitting on thousands of doses uh, because they can only administer so many uh, during a week or two-week period uh, because of the lack of, of the infrastructure here, the lack of stores uh, within within Vermont. So uh, we were able to claw some of those back uh, and put them to our advantage. Um, but, but again, it highlights the fact that my preference would be that we receive uh, the supply and that we distribute to the pharmacies as partners um, in, a, in a way that is efficient and that in a way that they can use them up. Um, but so we, we get charged uh, for that inventory as well. So uh, our total is the overall total and we get charged for even if they're sitting in their inventory and it's the same with 1a i mean we there were hospitals that received some of the vaccination a vaccine uh and uh, and they had um, some some inventory as well so i think again because of our small state it really does have an effect on our overall performance okay that makes sense thanks governor Thank you, Rebecca. Good afternoon, Governor. Uh, we're hearing from multiple child care providers who are, and I hope I get this right, are registered with the state but unlicensed, uh, and they're feeling like they're being left out of the system for vaccines. One of these ch child care providers uh, serves a family, uh, which includes a doctor, uh, another uh, another one of these families uh, that we heard from uh, has another health care provider in them. Many of these providers are, are already feeling like they're being held to a different standard by state regulations, uh, and, and this seems to just be exacerbating that, that, that feeling. Governor, I'm, I'm hoping you can address why the state would disclude these types of child care workers in the current vaccination stage. Greg, this is Mike Smith. We, we have... Um, use the list that we can find, and that's licensed child care workers. And we're using licensed child care workers um, as the basis to vaccinate uh, those child care providers. I think it's a, it's a good method that we have. We know who they are. They're licensed. Um, that, that does not um, uh, allow sort of any sort of uh, ambiguity in terms of what um, what is what is going on out there? Uh, you know, the governor has mentioned this many times, and and I wish it was different, but it isn't different. We have X amount of supply that comes in. We have to figure out the best way to distribute that that supply in the most efficient and effective way as possible. We've used the list of licensed child care providers. Um, as the supply becomes greater. Um, we'll continue to expand um, through our age bands as we, we go through those age bands. That will capture a lot, a lot of people. And I, I think the governor is sort of uh, forewarned. This is going to go fairly fast um, as we move forward. So I would say to those child care providers um, that are either single family or non-licensed, uh, we'll get to you. But right now we have, we're using licensed uh, child care as the criteria for um, for moving forward, primarily because we know who they are. So um, I, I'm told that the state does know who uh, the unlicensed providers are because they still have to register with the state. Is that wrong? Well, let me do this. Let me get the exact um, situation that you're describing and let me look into it and we'll we'll reach out to you greg and get the exact because uh, you know these these many times these one-offs don't appear to be what they actually are so let me let me get the the actual situation and we'll take a look at that sure thank you and uh i think that'll be it for me today thank you governor tim from our business magazine 
Hi, Governor. Obviously, the American Recovery Act is not law until the president signs it, but um, there's very high expectations that will, that will happen by the end of this week. And you've mentioned uh, using one-time money for one-time projects. And there's big kahuna items on there like um, broadband and wastewater that you've mentioned. But it'd be easy to see how this gets parsed out into many, many projects, uh, and then it becomes um, uh, literally watered down, and you're not getting enough to make a substantial impact on wastewater or broadband. How, how do you keep that from happening, or, or is, is that what you want? I'm trying to get a sort of a philosophical... Well, again, from my standpoint, we want to get the biggest bang for the buck, and we want to make sure that we prioritize what our initiatives are. I think you can look back to our budget and get an idea of where I think we should focus. Uh, we are also uh, asking our cabinet members uh, to come back to us. They're working on this. In fact, we have already established a, a working list, and uh, they'll be presenting it. The Secretary of Administration, Secretary Young, will be presenting that uh, to me. And then we'll work through that to present something to the legislature as a framework uh, as to how we move forward. So, uh, again, there will be some uh, smaller uh, projects, I'm sure, that will be included. Um, but, uh, but we really do want to focus on areas of uh, biggest need. Again, uh, climate change mitigation, weatherization, um, uh, initiatives with uh, a sewer and water, storm water, uh, so forth. Uh, those are areas that uh, we have significant need in, in the state, haven't been able to figure out how to, uh, to pay for it, uh, and this is uh, something that we should, we should focus on, again, to strengthen this foundation for future generations because we've been, we've been struggling with deferred maintenance and so forth uh, in some of these uh, infrastructure needs. Uh, you know this better than uh, anyone else probably that there, you know, the legislature could take one-time money and actually pensions that have been mentioned in this already and using a, a large chunk on pensions, which would mean that they wouldn't have to put as much from the budget, you know, how this would work. Um, that would be sort of getting around the idea of using one-time money for one-time purposes. I, I'm sure you have some sort of plan. I'm wondering if you can yeah. hear how to um, well, again, that. We know the, the pension uh, unfunded liability is a huge issue for our state. It's grown from 4.3 billion uh, in unfunded liabilities to about 5.7 billion over the last couple of years. Um, so this has an impact on us. So I know that Treasurer Pierce uh, and uh, the legislature has committed to moving forward. I've said that we will uh, be uh, at the table with them, but this is an opportunity for them. They need to lead on this. Uh, and again, I don't want this to be uh, deemed as partisan, but they're in the majority. Um, they, uh, they need to lead on this issue, and uh, we'll work with them in any way we can, uh, but, um, but we need to solve this. There's some structural problems with the pension uh, liability, the pension system, the OPEB system, um, and uh, so we need to to bring that all together, uh, come up with a solution, and uh, and move forward. Now, whether the, I, I don't believe the recovery money can be utilized for pension um, pension deficits, uh, but um, but there are other ways around that, as you noted, um, to uh, to make that happen. But again, we'll um, we'll be at the table. We'll do what we can uh, to again strengthen the future uh, of our economy uh, for the future generations uh, so that we uh, we come out of this stronger than we went in. All right. Thank you, Governor. Ann Wallace-Allen, seven days. Ann, seven days. All right. We'll go to Kat at WCAX. Can you hear me now? Yes. Go ahead, Ann. Um, I think this is for Dr. Levine. People are starting to go to pharmacies to get uh, leftover vaccinations at the end of the day that would otherwise go to waste. I've heard about this in Vermont and um, in other states. And I'm wondering, is there any way to create waiting lists for these people so that at the end of the day, you know, they could call people and say, why don't you can come in now and even yeah. if you're not in the exact age band. Secretary Ooh. Smith.
And we have issued through the health department have issued um, guidelines in terms of what you do with um, excess dosage at the end of the day. And there is a priority list that you're um, supposed to be following and that that priority list uh, includes um, advance appointments, appointments that you have uh, in the future that you can bring forward and call those lists. You have the names, you have the numbers. Um, 1A, um, if you have uh, anybody that is scheduled that are 1A in uh, sort of those healthcare workers. Uh, number two is the next age band. If you, uh, number three is the next age band. If there is, a, you know, in this case, it would be, you know, the uh, 5B or or even uh, lower. Uh, the next band, the next thing you would do is that if there is nobody um, out there, um, if there's something that you can get to home health, uh, somebody that's homebound, that would be one area as well. But the procedure says at the end of the day, if there is no one, um, then uh, don't waste that dosage. Get it into somebody's arms, a arm, and that is uh, that's the procedure. All the pharmacies have that procedure. All the healthcare facilities have that procedure. All of our uh, vaccination sites have that procedure. So uh, we hope that they follow that procedure and uh, set up their own. Uh, their own sort of criteria because there's multiple ways that various locations do it set up their criteria uh, set up their their system based upon that criteria but we we definitely ask them to set up a a system a callback system based upon that great thank you um also has the state health department encountered any vaccine refusal among school staff or just people who work in school buildings Boy, I don't, yeah, it's kind of early. Um, this was just Monday. I, I don't know if we would have that information. And Dr. Levine is shaking his head no. I don't know if we've ha we ha would have that information yet. I will say this, we've had high um, uh, intake on, uh, uptake on healthcare workers in general. Um, and we have some information on that and we have a high uptake with, um, with residents of, uh, of long-term care facilities. So we do have, you know, we've seen high uptake. And as you saw in uh, Commissioner Pichek's um, slide, 82% of 75 plus, that's a pretty high uptake. Okay, um, uh, last but not least, when, when you talk about getting back to the age bands, is it possible to give us any idea of say, when people 60 and over or 55 and over might be next in line? I know that, as you said, it depends on vaccine supply, but if vaccine supply stayed as it is right now, do you have any idea when those groups would be able to start becoming eligible to register, say, 60? Yeah. Um, I would expect uh, sometime in the next um, two weeks um, from my standpoint. But we'll, uh, we'll have, uh, as I said earlier, uh, in, within the next two weeks, we'll be able to uh, lay out our plan, our strategy uh, for uh, the age bands and, and when you might expect uh, those to come up. So stay tuned on that, but, uh, but those in the 60 to 65, I would say in the next couple of weeks. Um, I, I just wanted to make uh, clear something else, I'll, uh, and I think you, you talked about a refusal in the schools. I just want to make sure everyone understands we're not forcing teachers uh, to receive a vaccination, so I'm not sure how they would refuse uh, it's a sign up system uh, and they they can they can have the receive the vaccine or not maybe i should have used the word decline yeah yeah uh, too early at this point because we're and we're using both um, those on site uh, in the schools as well as the pharmacies so it's going to take a little while to work all that out and see but but from what we gathered uh, when we sent the survey out a high, high percentage of people, uh, of uh, staff members who are willing to receive the, uh, the uh, vaccine, which is one reason why we decided to move forward. Okay. Thank you very much. Kat, WCAS. 
I'm following up on my question from Friday. Governor, my colleague Olivia asked the NEA and a superintendent yesterday whether they would be back to full in time, uh, full in person learning once their teachers are vaccinated. And the short version was they felt that it, it itself was not enough and that they felt they couldn't go safely back to in person learning if students could not stay uh, six feet apart. What was your response upon hearing that? Yeah, I, I don't know that that's uh, across the board. In fact, I, I think I was watching CEX this morning and you reported a story where Essex uh, Westford uh, has committed to going back in person in April. So I think uh, we'll see. I think there'll be some momentum. I think it'll inspire others to do the same. And we have to, again, instill some faith and trust. So uh, as we vaccinate more of the school staff, I think there'll be more of an inclination to going back. And I, and I would hate to put them on the spot at this point in time. Uh, again, we just, uh, they need to feel comfortable with this. They need to be safe. Um, we need to listen to the experts, the scientists, the healthcare experts and others to determine, uh, you know, like distancing requirements. That's something they have to discuss and they have to be comfortable with and then communicate to the, uh, the schools and so forth. So that's not a political decision. This is going to be a uh, science-based decision. Well, that leads into my follow-up question quite well, actually. So, Dr. Levine, does the health department feel that it is safe for students to go back to in-person learning full-time if the spacing requirements cannot be met in the classroom? Or do you feel that the spacing requirements are no longer needed for some reason after people are vaccinated um, from the teacher standpoint? I just want to remind everyone as well that uh, the elementary schools have had a, a three-foot distance. Many of them have already gone back into in-person instruction or, or from the very start, and have done so quite successfully. Dr. Levine. <clears throat> and just the additional, the health department is actually using science and data as well, and there are studies pending that are coming out that will help inform this. The CDC director has more or less said the same thing. Um, and they had put out some preliminary guidance, but said that there will probably be some changes coming. Um, so we need to be a little bit patient as well. But as the governor says, and I believe Secretary French has some data behind this, the percentage of elementary schools that have more in-person education is quite high in Vermont. So it's not that they're returning to anything, they're already there. Uh, it's the more higher level grades uh, where these decisions will have more impact. And I, I have to say this again, vaccination is really going to be a wonderful uh, pathway, if you will, to moving forward, but it is not the prerequisite. Um, none of the guidance that's come out from anywhere has said that schools can't operate if teachers aren't vaccinated. Teachers are going to feel a lot more comfortable and will be more protected by being vaccinated. But the goal is to set up schools in a way that everyone feels safe regardless of that, knowing that the majority of students, except for maybe 11th or 12th graders at best, uh, won't be able to be vaccinated until we have a vaccine that uh, has been authorized for that age group. I guess what we're trying to set out for the people who have emailed us with questions about this is, is that three foot spacing requirement safe for the older grades as well as for the elementary school students? Yeah, and I'm gonna hedge on that because we are really waiting some data that's uh, gonna, I think, shed a little better light on that. Uh, so I don't wanna say anything more than that for now. Okay, um, when will we expect that data? Uh, it's not coming from me, so I, I can't give you the date that that date is coming out. Nationally, people have talked about having it this month, um, but that's all I know. Thank you. Andrew, Caledonian Record. Uh, yes, good afternoon. Um, Governor, a question for you and for Dr. Levine um, regarding the court proceedings in Newport. Um, involving the UPS store owner. Um, for the governor, uh, reaction to an argument that's being presented this morning uh, that the mask mandate and the emergency powers you've used to issue it are unconstitutional. And for Dr. Levine, response to the testimony yesterday from a microbiologist arguing that uh, masks are ineffective um, and as well the notion that the short duration um, 
uh, of interaction within that type of store really limited exposure risk? Um, well, the first part, from a constitutional standpoint, I think uh, we're quite confident uh, that it is constitutional. Uh, the powers that I have during a, a state of emergency are broad, and uh, and guidelines that are invoked are are just like law. So um, I think it's constitutional. I think that they will um, come to that conclusion themselves. But we'll see how the court uh, proceeding goes. Dr. Levine. <clears throat> You know, I'll be careful to not say too much because this is an ongoing proceeding, but our state epidemiologist uh, testified yesterday and provided uh, all the kind of factual information I would have provided if I was testifying regarding the impact of masks on uh, potential transmission of droplets um, and infecting other people, the impact of mask mandates um, where they have been put into play on improvement in rates uh, of transmission. And a, I'm not sure she referred to the study, but I believe she may have. There was a, a recent um, morbidity, mortality weekly report from CDC, again, looking at the impact of mask mandates and showing a dramatic decline within a 20-day period of uh, COVID infections. Um, so there's a lot of supporting data um, that I believe was uh, presented at this trial. And um, best I stop there. Okay, thank you, everyone. Again, I just want to add once again, as I've said before, um, this is a uh, unfortunate situation and completely avoidable. So uh, it's unfortunate that there has to be any court proceeding at all. I am, yes. Thank you. Ed, Newport Daily Express. Hey, good afternoon. I, I, I'm going to have a, a question here. It's about compliance and um, and getting the uh, cards that uh, show that you've been vaccinated. And what I'd like to do is offer two scenarios and ask me how, uh, how we're, we're supposed to respond. If a person walks into, a couple people walk into a bar or rest hut, without a mask on, um, is the uh, manager supposed to ask them if they've been vaccinated and to prove it so they can be in the, in the place with, without wearing a mask? And also, if a law enforcement officer goes into a business and sees an employee who's not wearing a mask, do they have to ask them for proof that they uh, have been vaccinated? Yeah, these are scenarios that uh, I don't know as I have the answer to. Um, maybe Commissioner Sherling at this point, and these may be just details we need to to work out um, because this is going to get more complex. I think the CDC guidance uh, made it a little bit more, uh, the complexity increased uh, as a result. But um, But these are things we're going to have to work through over the next three to four months. And... Uh, again, because this is going to happen quickly, uh, we're going to get more and more people, uh, Vermonters vaccinated over the next uh, three months. We think we'll we'll get at least the first dose into the majority, and uh, and if we have exceptions for those who can wear masks if they're vaccinated, uh, and we still have the mask mandate, uh, obviously these are questions that are are going to continue. So we'll um, we'll work through that. Um, Commissioner Shirley, anything you want to add to that, or would you like to just take a pass? Uh, at this point, Governor, I would only add that, uh, as you observed, the mask mandate uh, still in place. We do, of course, anticipate that uh, that will remain for some period of time, even as vaccine continues uh, to mitigate spread. So it's not an issue yet. Uh, it is something we'll, we'll contemplate uh, as we move forward. Okay, very good. Thank you. Tom, Compass, Vermont. Hi, thanks for taking my call. Um, in the PowerPoint deck, it says that uh, Vermont ranks 11th in percentage of population fully vaccinated. 
Where does Vermont fall in percentage of population having received at least one dose? Commissioner Pichek. Yeah, Tom, we can check on that in terms of the one dose. Um, the CDC definitely provides information about all doses administered, so they include first doses with the second doses to get um, a ranking. Um, and on that ranking, we're 13th. Um, I think we put that in the slide deck as well. But in terms of a single dose, um, we don't track that, but we'll see if the CDC provides that information. Thank you. I, one of the reasons I was curious is that looking at uh, a letter sent to the New England Journal of Medicine uh, from a couple of physicians in Canada talking about the fact that from the Food and Drug Administration, if you take if you, if you don't start measuring until two weeks after someone has the first dose, that they found from that data that the first dose can be up to 92% effective with Moderna and Pfizer, which would lead one to think that it might be more beneficial to get more people vaccinated by getting more first doses out first, as some states are doing. Was that taken into consideration here? Um, well, again, we talked about that uh, initially, but we decided to move uh, through through to the full vaccination. That was our strategy from the start. We decided to continue to fulfill that. Um, again, adding to the complexity is the Johnson Johnson single dose, and how that uh, correlates as well. Is that a you know that's that'll be first and last dose, and uh, and how that uh, has an effect on the the data. So. Um, We'll have to we'll have to see. Uh, again, there are some states that look as though they're way ahead in terms of uh, using their vaccine supply, but they may be using the strategy of of using uh, all their doses for first dose and not not fully vaccinating. So that's why we're keeping track of it uh, in terms of full full um, vaccination. Uh, last question: you, will, would, would your administration consider pivoting and going to single dose and postponing the second dose for some, just to get more people vaccinated in, in time? Not at this stage. Um, I think we're committed uh, to the process we have in place, and as we, you'll see by the end of the month, when I, uh, over the next couple of weeks, when I describe um, the what we see as the next two or three months, how fast we're going to get through this. So we're committed to the process we have, and we'll just keep uh, adhering to the strategy. Okay, thanks very much. Maliha, Burlington Free Press. Um, I think my question I have a couple would be for Dr. Levine or Secretary Smith. Um, the first one, we've heard from a few people that newly hired healthcare workers might need to hold off on getting their vaccinations. And I see that UVMMC has a wait list for people in the tier 1A group. So I was wondering if you could give some details on the state's protocol when it comes to vaccinating newly hired healthcare workers. I assume any wait list boils down to allocation estimates. Um, but if you could just provide some background, should they expect to get on the UVMMC wait list? Are there other mechanisms for people who are recently licensed to sign up and, and get their vaccine? Yeah, so you're talking about new people to the healthcare workforce. Um, and I believe yeah. uh, we still get requests for allocations from all of our partners in the healthcare system on an ongoing basis. So if those are accounted for in the mix, they will be accounted for in the 1A. We're also pivoting towards an ability for 1A eligible people to go onto the website and register themselves. That is not operative today, um, but that is hoped for in the near future. So that workforce will be taken care of either way. Great, and I just wanted to follow up on the safe prioritization of the BIPOC communities in the vaccine rollout. I just wanted to make sure, so the idea is that someone who's a member of the BIPOC community and falls into one of the eligible vaccine groups can also bring household members who are outside of that vaccine group to get vaccinated. Is that the idea? That is exactly the idea, and that's what we've been doing in the uh, ELL, or English Language Learner community, thus far. Great. And 
And I think um, just a quick follow up then, because the BIPOC community is relatively small, has the state considered opening up uh, a vaccine group for them specifically, or is the supply too limited at this point to make that call? Yeah, I think at the point that we made our initial decisions, we felt that <clears throat> even though you say small, <clears throat> for any community or any group that's interested in getting a uh, vaccine in general, it's always thousands of people. So uh, small is all relative. And when we uh, initially made all of the decisions we were making, we wanted to make sure that this group had priority within each of the specified groups that we'd already delineated. And that's the way we've maintained it and we'll keep going with them. Great, thank you. This thing is almost over. Governor, Catholic leaders across the country are asking the faithful to decline the Johnson & Johnson vaccine because its more testing and development involve stem cells from aborted fetuses. Um, is this true about the vaccine? Uh, have you seen any opposition in Vermont? And how would you advise Vermonters of conscience uh, to proceed? Well, again, uh, Guy, it's our plan. Uh, to allow people to make that choice. Uh, I, I've heard on the other side uh, of the equation where many people are waiting uh, for the Johnson Johnson, they want uh, the one shot, uh, shot regiment and, uh, and they're looking forward to that. So I, I think it'll be fine either way. And I would just say if, uh, if you do not want uh, the Johnson Johnson, you're not going to be forced to have it. Uh, we'll make sure that you get on a list for the other Moderna and Pfizer vaccine. Thank you. Um, do you expect to make remote working for state employees a permanent thing? Uh, you've extended the work at home for most state employees through April. What, what is the plan on state employees returning to their offices? Yeah, it's still a, a work in progress. Uh, I may ask uh, Secretary Young to comment on this as well. Uh, but I would expect in the future there are going to be a certain percentage of those who can work remotely. Not everyone can and not everybody wants to. So uh, we're trying to contemplate that for the future. I'm sure it'll be part of the future. I just don't know the, the percentages and, and what the uptake will be. But we'll have those conversations. Secretary Young, anything you want to add to that? Um, thank you, Governor. Yeah, we're looking very closely at what the future of the workforce is in terms of uh, remote work and the balance between remote work and in-office work. Um, so we are got a good survey from the workforce that seems to be quite satisfied with some hybrid, if not a full-time model remote. And we're taking that and we're now working through, um, you know, uh, several options with with cabinet members and the like to see what works for each department and agency. So my expectation is there'll be a hybrid. Thank you. Pam uh, Davis of Vermont Journal. Can Start, you hear me? Yeah, go ahead, Ham. Uh, Governor, I'd like to just change the format just very briefly at this press conference. I'm very concerned about the blood sugar level of your team, and I don't think there's much oxygen left there for long, <laughs> rambling stuff. So what I'd like to do is this. I'd like to just ask Mark Levine over the next five to six weeks um, to, if he would consider the question of the thing that's looming past the immediate, the immediate time, which is that we're going to we may have to the we may have to deal with the uh, the uh, Brazil um, variant and the South African variant, and that could get to that could get to the question of whether um, we're going to need um, booster shots for people that have already been uh, been vaccinated. I, that's a really complex mess, and I understand that, and I don't even want to hear the answer right now. I just hope that Mark Levine would be able to. Uh, incorporate uh, a look at that as we go forward over the next five, six weeks, because uh, we're really going to have it's, the question is going to get more complicated. The uh, the second question is would be to, the same idea to um, to uh, Mike Smith, which is 
Uh, I understand that the, that everybody's all all hands on deck for the for the virus distribution, and I'm not. I don't disagree with that. I think I think the state of Vermont. This this my opinion, and eight bucks gets you coffee. But I think you guys are doing an awesome job. Um, but the but as far as Mike Smith is concerned, uh, we talked oh a couple of months ago about rebooting one care one care Vermont. The reform is still sitting out there, and it is taking shape inexorably because all the budgets for fiscal year 2022 are now starting to go together. And I would think that um, over the next well, maybe six eight weeks, that uh, if if uh, Mike Smith and his team can get some time, that they would that they would begin to tell us a little bit about where they're headed on this matter. Yeah. Anyway, I'm, I'm not listening to the answer, guys. I, I'd like to have you look at those. Well, he's Thank got the same much. answer as Dr. Levine. Uh, he just shook their head yes. So, okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and that concludes the media briefing. We'll see you again on Friday.